Hey there. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm so excited to talk to you today. <laughs> I'm so excited to get to talk to you. I am new to this microphone situation, so I am trying to like not be the loudest person on the planet right now. Um, so that's like that it's really that self-projectedness that I'm like, I can't, I can't be too seen. Don't, don't let them see me too much. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Do you, is it like, can you control it to turn it down? Yes. The mic, I think I can. Yeah. I it, think that's coming down a little bit. Yeah. yeah is that better? Like, yes. That's okay, a lot. There better. we go. It's there not go. like you're screaming at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I just got this microphone. I actually got it to to write music and play music and then people were like well you need a microphone if you're going to be on a podcast I'm like all right it worked out <laughs> yeah so you write music too girl you just do, do. everything don't you I, it's a lot there's a lot going on over here <laughs> yeah because even when I was just looking at your website and I was just I'm so fascinated with what you're doing and how you're bringing oh. human design in and how you're bringing the intimacy into what Thank you're doing you. I'm just really fascinated with everything you have going on Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to talk to you about it, all of it. <laughs> it's like, it's so funny because after I went through my certification program, my, uh, the person who is providing that program had reached out and wanted to do a podcast as well. And I just kind of started talking about intimacy and relationships for human design. And she was like, wait, 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 wait. Um, and I'm also polyamorous. And so that's like another additional layer to all of this, which I think is super fascinating. And I know folks haven't really talked a lot about human design and polyamory. And so I feel like that connection feels really important to me and like being able to, you know, speak about that. But I think all of that really projects onto all relationships, right? Whether you're mon monogamous or um, polyamorous. And so, yeah, I'm excited to get to share with uh, with you and with others about it. And um, the other thing I was going to say is I also would love to go live with you on TikTok if that's cool. I'm new to it. So <laughs> yeah, um, I think I'll just find you and then get on there with you. I'm not sure. Do you want to, you mean like right now? Oh, sorry. I meant whenever, are we doing this on TikTok as well? No. Cause so like I had tried oh, before. Okay. Okay. I read that in the thing. And so I was like, oh, I need to be set up for that. Um, good. Great. No, I need to go edit that. I realized like there's just way too much going on. Like trying to like feed my audience and make sure that I have this connection because this recording yeah. is what's important. And every time I tried to do too much, it was like something would mess up. Yeah. Uh, so we're simplifying it now. Perfect. Well, then if you're okay with it, what I would love to do is just record myself on my camera while we're talking so I can maybe use blips of things that I say um, on my TikTok or in future things that I want to promote. Is that okay? I can send you the video, uh, the recording so that you can just oh, take cool. little bits of it. Yeah, let's yeah, just do that. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. yeah, let's great. Do <laughs> yeah I'm all about sharing teamwork, baby. Teamwork. Cool. cool. Awesome. Uh, but yes, yeah, Sage, one of the things, even with what you mentioned earlier, and I'm recording this, by the way, this is all going on yeah. my podcast, and so we're just going to flow it. right into this. But one Let's of the things it. that I find fascinating with you being polyamorous, and then you having that defined um, G center. And then I went and looked and I was like, let's get even more details. And then I went and looked and I'm like, where's this gate 59 for her? Because you've got gate 59 in the third line. Keynote is the gate of openness and being open and being vulnerable. And I'm like, she is doing it. <laughs> she is tapping it into these gifts and so I just would love to hear I guess how you found human design and then like mm -hmm. what just kind of happened with you yeah. when you found it yeah great question so you're frozen I just want to make sure we're good are we good oh no oh oh no <laughs> you're good on my end okay I'll just talk then and we'll just roll with it okay <laughs> there you're not broken up anymore okay. um yeah so I found human design back in 2020, uh, right in the middle and the heart of the pandemic. So it's actually really fascinating that you're speaking to this uh, line three and this gate 59 and all of these things about the openness and vulnerability, because I wasn't that way for a very long time. And, you know, when I was growing up, I felt like a lot of what I was told was that vulnerability, emotions, being open, sharing, being, you know, willing to tell people what's going on with you and how you're feeling was a negative thing, right? And we shouldn't do that. And we should be quiet and all of these things. And so um, I grew up really kind of conditioned with that, right? And not really thinking about if I could do anything different, if it was supposed to be or look any different. And so I was in a number of relationships from the time I was like 16, really up until I was about 26, 27, uh, and was really codependent in my relationships. And 
2020 was the year that I had finished my master's degree, moved myself completely across country, like severed all of my relationships and really just kind of started going at it on my own and really was pushing myself to see, you know, what am I capable of and, you know, what can I do if I just go at it alone? And so in 2020, the pandemic hit and I was living alone at the time. So was pretty solitary uh, for the majority of that time. We were all quarantining together. And in that time, I also had gotten the diagnosis of COVID. And it was at a time when we were still very unsure about it and, you know, the side effects and, and what it meant to receive that diagnosis. And so I had this kind of dark night of the soul in that moment of, right, like, I what am I doing here? I mean, I just have journals on journals on journals with the words like, what am I doing here? What is my purpose? Why are we even here? And I just was really trying to understand what is my purpose here? And what am I here to give back to the communities that I'm a part of, to the universe at large? And, and why am I here on this planet? And so that kind of just led me down just a spiritual awakening in general, reading a ton of books and things like that. And then I actually found the Human Design Academy, which is where I got certified, just kind of scrolling on TikTok, looking through YouTube, those types of things, and was like, you know, really into astrology and some of these other mechanisms of, you know, just understanding your personality tools um, to think about how you navigate best. And was really curious about human design because it really coupled astrology and some quantum physics and these other things that I was really interested in. And I was like, wow, I wonder what this is like as a full system. So then I pulled my chart. First thing I found out was that I was a projector and I just deep dived into the projector aura just by itself. I was like, I don't really care about anything else right now. I'm like, this is super overwhelming. I'm just going to look at the projector or a type and what it means. And just the strategy alone and just really figuring out what projectors are meant to do in this world and how they're meant to navigate completely just transformed me. And I felt like it was almost like a coming home to self where I was like, oh, I get it now. I get why I'm like this now. Like I get why I'm operating like this and why it's not working and why it feels so difficult and why I'm so resentful, so, so resentful of so many things and jealous and all of these really hard and big emotions, which I would say ultimately three years later have been like the catalyst for really, for me to even be able to dip into my vulnerability and my openness and to be able to share with folks, right? Because for such a long time, I had told myself this story that, you know, Nobody else goes through these types of experiences. Nobody else messes up. Nobody else makes mistakes. Nobody else is doing these things. And um, the more I started really, really looking into my design, I was like, no, I'm meant to share this. I'm meant to share with people what it means to overcome things, to make mistakes and struggle, and what it means to come out on the other side of that and to have an evolution and growth in that, and that we are all individually deeply capable of transformation and growth. Wow. <laughs> I love that and resonated so much because when I found out I was a projector, I was like, oh yeah. Okay. Um, got it. Uh -huh. I, I get it. Okay. Let's, let's just take everything back. And so I find yeah. that so fascinating where I, that's really interesting that, you know, in your journals, it was like, what am I supposed to do? Where am I meant to go? Right. Um, how do you feel like you really tapping into that G center has brought transformation into your life. Cause I've got an undefined G center and I'm like, talk to me. What does this feel like? I want to know. I love undefined G's so much because you all are always sampling and trying on new personalities and new identities. And I'm like, Oh, you're so, it's so rich. It's so, so rich. And you know, I am a biracial person. I grew up living in Japan uh, until I was about 11 before we moved to the States. And so um, having this juxtaposition of identity, right, uh, was really interesting for me as a defined G-Center because I was always really hyper aware that I had these identities that were in intermingled and had a duality to them and was so deeply confused by the discomfort that my mere presence brings people sometimes, right? My full knowingness of self, even just my intersecting identities being present in the space, all of those things. But even in when I would feel people's discomfort, I was always like, but I know who I am. I know who I am. And I would say that because the rest of my chart is so open, right? I only have my G center and my throat defined. That's it. I got so much conditioning from the external lenses that I would even try on things, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a six line. So I'm also right in that first phase of my life, trying things a lot and, and thinking about what works. And 
in that first um, phase of my life, I really was trying and sampling things, but I never felt myself dive so deeply that I felt lost, right? Like I just knew that I was like, I knew that I was sampling in a way. I was like, I'm going to try this on. And I have a theater background and really love the whole idea of like manifesting through delusion and like stepping into this version of yourself that you're trying to be. And so I would do that. I'd be like, I mean, yeah, I'm going to do this. I mean, I was in a sorority for a while in college. I worked a lot in college. I, you know, tried a bunch of different things like French club. I did drama. I did cheerleading. Like there was just all sorts of things I was always trying because I, I really wanted to know myself more deeply. And I think that was really what the journey was about, right? Never like, do I need to find myself in others, but how do I find myself more deeply in the presence of others and in their identities, right? Because oftentimes what I feel is that everyone is just a mirror of whatever it is that we're also experiencing or what we're trying to overcome or release or maybe need to address or grapple with in our lives. And from a very young age, I feel like I've always been able to see that it was a mirror. I never felt like it was a, a, a collision of the things. It was always that we were reflecting one another. <clears throat> I can't say I had that same experience. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so fascinated. I would love to hear about without the the undefined G, you know, what that's like when you're sampling and kind of moving through that. Well, it's just even just like talking about my current state right now, I'm still trying to figure out like who I am. Like, and this yeah. is what I mean by that. Um, when I was younger, I dressed like a boy. Like, but yeah. this is when we were in elementary school and everyone looked the same. You all had to wear the yep. same colors. And I was like, oh, yep. well, I'm going to be comfortable then. So I wore yep. baggier pants, baggier shorts, and I played with all the dudes. I couldn't get a, yeah. I was so scared of girls. <laughs> so scared. Of, it's because I was so Fair. different. Yeah. so different. I was cross-eyed. I was bigger than the girls. Like yeah. I just, I didn't fit in. Like I just, yeah. I was so awkward. And so there was this time, you know, when you transition and you're not wearing those clothes anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then I was like, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do? And then it's like, do I dress like a boy? Do I dress like a girl? And my yeah. house was not accepting of mm. this. Like mm. I still mm. have trauma triggers where yeah. I'll try on clothes and I get so uncomfortable because like, my mom kind of made me uncomfortable because we were shopping yeah. in the guy section. Yeah. And what I've been working on right now is like just completely dissecting this identity that I built for myself because yeah. I was a fitness coach and like I, yeah. I wore like tighter clothes because I had the yeah. body for it. And I right. was literally just like projecting this image because yeah. at those times it was like <clears throat> I was in this phase where if I looked healthy, you thought I was healthy, but deep yes. inside, I was not healthy mentally, physically, emotionally. I was struggling so bad, but I was a fitness coach. So I was like, I have right. to have this presence. I have to do, and I burnt myself out. Yeah. And what I've been doing now is like, who am I? What do I want to look like? Who I'm like, yeah. I've never cut my hair and like, I'm on the verge, like still trying to grow the confidence to cut my hair. Like, and that's what you said. We're here to be fluid and we're here to change, yeah. but I have had so much trauma with change that yeah. I'm still trying to let myself try on these different things and be yep. comfortable with it. I'm just so uncomfortable when something changes, but then my partner's yep. like, Hey, just, just, just wear it for like a week, yeah. see how it feels. And then like all the clothes that were uncomfortable, now they're comfortable and yeah. it's a huge process. So it's just, it's really interesting because a lot of my life, I looked for myself outside of myself. I was like, well, what's everybody else doing? I have no yeah. idea what, is this yeah. how we're supposed to look? Okay. Then I'm going to look that yeah. way. So I just mirrored people and I just, yeah. this is, this is what popular. This is what made people mm -hmm. like me. Um, mm -hmm. So I did mm -hmm. it to fit in because if I stuck out, it made me so nervous. I don't know, but yeah. with your, that's where it's like that defined G and that undefined yeah. G. Um, so it's been a real interesting process over here. I love that you're talking about change and evolution as this like identifying factor in this as well, because I think, you know, that's kind of why I wrapped my business around the name Butterfly Priestess, right? Because I believe that we can all be our own divinity when it comes to change, right? And evolution and that we can understand ourselves deeper than anybody else can understand us. And we can shepherd ourselves through that change and evolution and growth, right? Being the caterpillar, then cocooning, and then turning into a butterfly. And for me, it's not just a one 
one time process, right? It's not, oh, okay, my caterpillar are just my kid years, and then my cocoon is my middle, you know, mid years, and then my caterpillar is my elder years. I'm doing that all the time. I feel like I am constantly a caterpillar, constantly going into a cocoon, constantly then emerging as a new version of myself. And I think, you know, as I think about the G Center in particular, as I go through that evolution, I oftentimes don't have a lot of fear about how people will perceive my identity. And I think that that's because I have this knowing that my identity is for me. It's not for anyone else, right? And that if at the end of the day, I'm not good with who I am and how I'm behaving and how I'm operating and what my value values are in this world, then what am I even doing, right? What am I even doing here? And so you know, my first phase of, of my sixth line, you know, there were definitely were some trickling ins of that, right? You know, the conditioning that I definitely received in some of my more open centers definitely conflicted with my G center. And it was oftentimes like my G center was at odds with those open centers because he, it was like, they were fighting together to understand, well, what is actually right for me and what is actually true for me. Right. And it wasn't until I figured out what my authority was that I was actually able to start to discern that, right. As much as I was feeling into it and embodying it, once I was actually able to name and own, oh, my authority is a self-projected authority. I need to be able to talk these things out, hear the inflection in my voice, hear what is coming out of my mouth, and actually feel into that embodiment of my vocal energy to know what is right for me. I was much better positioned to make more aligned decisions, right? Because I've definitely made misaligned decisions, right? I think we all have. Um, and it wasn't until I found out that my authority that my G center was actually able to kind of come into balance with the rest of my open centers. Yeah. I mean, you nailed that one on the head because I don't know if you, my chart, I have two defined centers, but mine's my root and my spleen, um, oh! <laughs> you know? So it's like, I feel you. Cause like you have yeah. to be so still with that spleen and you have to be yeah. so aware. And that's where I feel like I've just been, it's taken me a good, good amount of time to decondition and still deconditioning because it's so easy for me to get pulled away from my spleen. And it gets so easy Absolutely. for me to get pulled away from like, does this feel secure for me? Does this feel right for me? Um, so really understanding my authority has, like you said, allowed you to really understand that conditioning, especially that society has placed on, on mm -hmm. us, um, which is, again, has been a huge transformation for me and really understanding because like... I guess with this undefined G center, you know, I tell my clients all the time and I keep reminding myself is that you just have to honor who you are today. And like, I, just, yeah. and that's one of the biggest things that I've been working on, um, which has been scary because what does honor yeah. me today has not been anything that has honored me in the past. And it's like, okay, let's just keep on moving forward. Um, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's scary. Like truly sometimes that, uh, that unknown, um, yeah, I don't know. It brings a lot of anxiety sometimes. It does. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think as projectors too, right? Us being the newest of the aura types, us really just trying to figure out how we're going to lead and step forward and, you know, kind of usher folks into this new evolution of change that's coming forward right now. I think, I think a lot of us are in that place right now. I think a lot of us are coming to our awakenings. I think a lot of us are really trying to ascertain and understand how do we develop ourselves in the best way, in the best light so that we can be of the best service, right? Because that's how I usually view things, especially with my G center as well, is that each of us has a unique gift to bring to the universe and to the collective and to whatever it is that we're doing in society. And that uniqueness is what's important, right? We don't want all of the same cut, copy and paste, same things that we wouldn't get anywhere. We would, we would basically stand still. And so if we want evolution, if we want growth, not even just for ourselves, but for the collective at large, we all have to be willing to stand in our own sovereign being and say, you know what? This is who I am. This is the uniqueness and the gifts that I bring to the world. And here is me, right? And the more that we can really ascertain that in our G center. And I think undefined G's have such a gift for that, right? When you all get that wisdom, when you all get to that place of identifying who you are, you can share with the rest of us, right? What does it mean to struggle to know who you are? Because I don't know what that means, right? I know some of it in some ways based on conditioning, but not in the ways that an undefined G will know that, right? And we need to hear that. We need to know what that's like. We need to experience and engage with that type of energy. And you all are the only ones that can provide that gift. Yeah. And it's like us sharing that gift kind of if, if you have a defined G center and you are feeling lost, it's almost like it brings that awareness of like, oh, OK, I understand. So that yeah. makes a lot of sense. You know, while you're talking, you know, it's so funny is I'm just like in awe because you've got that channel of awakening and it's just like it's just flowing <laughs> it. 
out of you and I love it so she's a strong one (laughs) yeah I'm like dang that channel of awakening is just it's so beautiful and you're so elegant you got such a strong voice and one of the things that I was looking at when I was looking at your content I was like what the heck am I noticing in her Mm -hmm. and you've got that motivation of desire and I think the way that you're coupling you know your motivation of desire and with intimacy and the way that you're really bringing that um that energy to your clients I think it's just it's just really beautiful to see Yeah. Thank you. It's really fascinating that you're saying this because I was on a walk this morning and I'm curating some intimacy classes for a particular offering that I'm about to send out. And one of the things that I was thinking about is that this notion of desire, right? I, I work with so many people who are just constantly like, I have no idea what I desire. And it's because they don't know themselves. They don't know, you know, what it is that they actually want because they've been so conditioned or conditioned to believe that they should want what other people want. You know, I work with a lot of folks who have people pleasing tendencies and my myself also had some people pleasing tendencies growing up. And just pushing, being able to push through that specifically in relationships, right? And relationships of all kinds. I I really use the term relationships to be broad and all encompassing. You know, I think a lot of people focus on romantic relationships as like the most important or the most valid relationships. But I think every form of relationship that we are in with any other being is so deeply valuable and so important. And we should know how to engage with one another, right? And most importantly, we should all be standing up for and asking for the things that we want, because that in turn built helps us build a life filled with the things that we actually want. And so in order to get to that place, right, we have to first ascertain who am I? What does that mean for me? And what does that ultimately mean for what I desire? And I think uncoupling this codependency and this heavy attachment that many of us have to our relationships, right? So like I'm in a relationship with someone and I take them wanting to go and run a marathon as a reflection of like, oh, well, I'm a couch potato because I don't want to run a marathon, right? Instead of seeing, no, this person wants to run a marathon because the marathon is important for them and their development and who they're becoming and the person that they want to be. And my role in that is to support them, to be there with them, to love them, to make the sign cheering on the sideline, right? I don't need to be doing everything that everyone else is doing in order to even participate or even be supportive in what other people are meant to be doing in the world, right? And I think so much of relationships is how do we just do the same thing as each other? And I don't think that actually builds a rich or conscious aware relationship. I think that builds complacency and settlement, right? Because everything is easy and comfortable and doesn't have any bumps. And um, I was at a retreat this last weekend and somebody was talking about this quote about you know, when you're looking at an EKG heart monitor, when somebody's line is flat, they are dead. But when their line is jumping and moving and has a pulse, they are alive. And so when we are asking people to be in relationship with us through those bumps and jumps and ups and downs, we're asking them to live with us, to be alive with us, to be present with us in what it means to be a human person that's experiencing this earth and whatever it is that we're doing, but is also a spiritual being that is, that surpasses this by so much, right. In so many different dimensions. I love that. The EKG thing that you just said. Absolutely. Cause it's one of the things, you know, <clears throat> my partner and I, we live in an RV. So, yeah. you know, yeah. So sometimes, you know, being in sync is the yeah. easier thing because there isn't a whole lot of room, you know, but we've actually gotten to this point where I was like, we, you know, We need to have our own identities, right? Be able to do our own things and then come together and co-create something. And that's what we've been working on is being able to split and to have our own things and to have our own identities so that we can come back together so that we can build trust and so that we can have that solid foundation um, with one another. So I think what you said is extremely important because you're right. It it does become comfortable when you find somebody who just does the same thing and finds and flow with you, but you want somebody to be able to ride those ups and downs with you. Absolutely because it gives space and opportunity for that to be real, right? Because the more that we say it's supposed to be steady and flatlining, the more we expect it to stay that way, right? And change in general is, is a big thing for people. It's always happening. It's always in existence. But what I've come to see in the work that I do with human design and also the professional that I, work that I do um, with consulting with organizations on change development is that people are deeply, deeply, viscerally uncomfortable with change because of the way that they orient around it, because of trauma that they have, because of an experience that they had. Because oftentimes what change means is that we are having to uproot and uplift 
conditioned belief systems or values or things that we have identified ourselves with and say, maybe that's not right for us anymore. Maybe we need to move from that. Maybe we need to change or evolve from that. And so then that brings up this question of identity, right? If I've attached my identity to being a nine to five worker, and now I want to go out on my own and be an entrepreneur, right? What does that mean for my identity and what I feel is true or false about me? And so being able to grapple with that and say, you know what, um, the truth is a nine to five job isn't right for me. Right. And I think the first time I spoke out loud, a 40 hour a week is too much work for me. I thought I was going to keel over and die because I was just so ashamed and embarrassed. I was like, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. But the more I started to say it and the more I started to put it out there, my G center was like, yes, yes, yes. This is what's right for you. This is what's right for you. And it's having that courage to, to step out of the identity that you have at a current time to say, you know what, this identity is no longer serving me or needs to evolve and shift to pull me to this next version of myself. And I'm going to have the courage to step forward and do that. But in order to make that decision, we have to know what we want, right? We have to have a desire. And I think complacency kills desire because what do you have to desire for if you feel like all of your needs are being bet, everything's in flow and everything's complacent? Yeah. 100%. Now you teach a lot of different things. I do. Do, you have, do you have, do you have a favorite thing that you teach? <laughs> Relationships are probably my favorite. So, you know, it's very fascinating to me that I was able to find such a synergy between all of the things that I love um, and that there is some way to bring them all together. It's very interesting. I'm not a Manny Jenny, but I am very multi-passionate, um, which is why I think I um, am around and date a lot of Manny Jennies. <laughs> Because they're so great and just so chaotic and beautiful. And I just, I love it so much. But yeah, so I have kind of three prongs of, of things that feel really important to me. One of them is intimacy and relationships. One of this, one of them is this change work that I do within organizations, largely around um, organizational change management, but also thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and how we create more spaces where people feel welcome and a sense of belonging. And then this third prong is around kind of shibari or the art of rope bondage, which is something I share a little bit about, which is about energetic embodiment for me. And so these synergies of these three things, right, when we're thinking about energetic embodiment, when we're thinking about change management, when we're thinking about, you know, intimacy and relationships, all of those have a synergy together. You can bring rope into your relationships. You can bring rope into conversations about intimacy and energetic exchange. Change management is really about the idea of change and evolution and how people orient against that, right? Oftentimes that's from a business case context, but what we're really seeing in that space is also the individual people who are part of that organization and business going through that change evolution and having their own experience, right? And so even though it's not maybe about me as a person, I have to learn a new system. I have to learn a new process. That's hard. It feels difficult. I'm struggling with it. It's bringing up feelings. And people, I think, in that sector want to pretend that feelings and energy aren't a part of what we do, but it's a part of who we are. And so anytime we're going into any type of interaction, even in a business setting, we're experiencing and engaging those emotions and those feelings, and we should be addressing them and naming and owning them so we can deal with them as we go through the change journey. And then intimacy and relationships change is a constant, right? And I think that going back to what you were saying about, you know, ending up in a flow with someone, I think that's great. And finding flow is great. But sometimes what can happen when we're in too deep of a flow is that we can become non-ambitious, right? We can begin to just become people who are just kind of sleeping at the wheel, right? You know, sometimes when you're driving, you'll drive and you'll end up somewhere and you're like, how did I get here? You know what I mean? Because you're just like thinking about other things and you're just driving, right? And that is a little bit how I think relationships can be sometimes. You know, you get in the car, you start the car, you drive the car, you know what you're doing, you know where you're going. And it's easy to just coast. And, you know, that's not a judgment. I'm not saying it's bad to coast or anything like that. I think that's normal and needed in a lot of, um, you know, spaces and times in our relationships. And are we still encouraging one another to still want for more, to still desire for more? And I think the societal conditioning around you should just be grateful that you have enough. You should just be grateful that you have this. You should just be grateful that you have a partner who even likes you or loves you or is nice to you. And it's like, should I? Like, is that? Like, I is that? <laughs> like what <laughs> um and you know for me I think that's something that was really hard for me with partners is that I have a very deep uh commitment to non-attachment and that's not the same as non-commitment right that's not saying I'm not committed to being here that's not saying I don't have a full intention of being a full partner to you with full intentions of showing up and being intimate and somebody you can rely on and being committed 
But what I am definitely saying is that if you choose a path that is not right for me, I will not walk it with you. And that is okay. And that doesn't mean that you're bad. That doesn't mean I'm bad. That doesn't mean anything about good or bad or morals or anything like that. It just means the alignment is off, right? And we should all be following our own alignment because that is only what is going to get us closer to our own truth. And if all we're doing is worrying about walking alongside other people in their truth, we will never get to our own. Yeah. Girl. <laughs> you know what? Do you know what I find so interesting? I find so interesting the fact. Okay, so you've got gate fifty nine in the third line, right? Mm -hmm, I've got mm -hmm. gate fifty nine in the second line. Okay, oh, yeah. Oh. So mine is more shyness and then mm. bold, and so I just love hearing how open and vulnerable. And then, like, even when I was looking at your chart, you've got like gate twenty nine in like four different places, and so it's really just it was oh, it's really beautiful to hear you say like I'm committed to you, but I'm not attached, and mm -hmm. I love that, and I love the freedom that you have in your relationships and the way that you speak about yeah. that because I truly do believe, and that's one of the reasons where it was hard for me to to be in relationships um, where I don't have freedom where I can't yeah. move and to be myself because I truly yeah. believe that we are again two completely different identities and co-creating something together and not wrapping ourselves up of just this is who we are right. um and so I find that it's really interesting with you having it in the third line and me having it in the second line because my sexuality I'm like yeah, I'm super shy, super yeah. shy. Like my, I'm like, yeah. oh, what? Like people, are like <laughs> people will be like, Brady, you're you're pretty, or they'll flirt with me, and I'm like, oh, yeah. what's going on? I got like, oh, it's okay, cool. Um, like even I worked at a bar, and I used to, I was a bouncer, and then people yeah. would hit on me all the time as they. Would I bet walk they in. would. Yeah, and people, <laughs> and people, and there was a guy I was working with. He was like, you don't do well with compliments, do you? And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't know what to do with them. Like, what do I do back? Like, what do I say? Like, I don't know. So I get really shy, but then there's moments, yeah. you know, where I'm bold and it's like, it's just, it's gotta be the right time. It's gotta be the right person. Yep. It's gotta be the right place, yep. but it's not, it's not something that happens all the time. Right. That hermit. It's like, mm -hmm. I go mm -hmm. and I go back and I'm like, mm -hmm. I have to be called out. It's yeah. gotta, everything has gotta be going really well. So I just find it so fascinating to hear the lines, even just how they manifest. Um, and that big yeah. difference right there. And I love that too, because you're speaking to exactly how we would work together, right? Like if we were going to be in a relationship of any sort together, knowing that about you, that means, oh, okay, I need to invite you to be bold. I need to invite you to step into that boldness because I know you have it and I know it's there, but you'll shy away from it. And so as a projector, right, you also need to be invited. And I think, I think I've said this before on my TikTok, but projectors clutch clutch at invitation giving. I think we are some of the best inviters on the face of this planet because we are so, so, so keen to being invited that, I mean, that's like the number one thing I get told from my friends. You are so great at inviting me because you recognize me, you see the value that I have, and then you connect it to an invitation, right? And so even if I was, you know, with you, I'd be like, hey, Hey girl, I know that that two line in your in your gate 59 needs to come out a little bit. So how would I go about right creating an invitation that would invite you to be bold with me in that openness, right? And in that vulnerability. And I think that's one of the beautiful ways that human design can really support us in our relationships, right? Thinking about how does somebody naturally operate? And I'm not going to people please for you, right? I'm not going to bend over backwards and just initiate all of the time and do all of this stuff because I know you're shy, right? I'm going to say, yeah, I can initiate a little bit because I know you have that shyness and I should definitely show up for that. But you also got that spicy boldness in there that I also should want to bring out of you as a partner that cares about you, right? And wants you to develop and grow as your own full person. And so being able to know that about you also can alleviate any feelings I might have about initiating, right? Oh, I'm having to initiate and like maybe that makes me feel vulnerable or scared or insecure, but I can just kind of look at your design and correlate that to, oh, okay, this is just a strategy for how we can engage and be connected and more close together versus taking it as an offense, right? That I'm having to initiate so much and things like that. And I think that's the number one thing human design, I think helps with relationships is that it can remove that defensive barrier and really just show us how to be good stewards of each other's energy. Yeah. I mean, it truly, I feel like saved, um, a, a, 
how do I say this? I don't want to say save my relationship, but, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it helped tremendously because also I have done this in every relationship where I remain separate. It's like, to mm. me, I remain my identity. It's like, if I have sex too much, my identity gets mm-hmm. lost in you. And I don't mm-hmm. like that. I have an undefined mm-hmm. G center. I yeah, cannot yeah. <laughs> lose myself in you. So I'm like, I've got to remain separate. I have to have yeah. this separateness. Um, yeah. And that's something that I've really learned about. But human design is the only I'm not, I guess the only type of modality that I found the language where I'm like, oh, yeah. that is exactly what I'm doing. And so yep. now, like me and my partner, we had that discussion and she was like, oh, well, well yeah, okay. I, okay. I get it. We can, yeah. we can do something else. Cause she was like, is it me? Like, am right. I doing right. something? And I'm like, it, uh, it's not you. I just kind of feel like I need to be called. I don't know. Like yeah, it's, yeah. I, it's, you know, um, so it did bring a lot of, you know, grace and compassion. And like, honestly, human design has truly helped my relationship on it. When we got into our relationship at the beginning, it was really toxic. We weren't supporting yeah. each other in a way like there was a yeah. very genuine connection, right? Obviously. Yeah. And so we have worked through a lot and have grown a lot. And now we're at the point where, like you said, growing, developing, I'm like, if we're not working towards something, if we're both not evolving, that's where we take a step back and we're like, what are we doing? What what can I do yeah. to support you? I see that, yeah. that you're kind of stagnant or maybe is there something that I can help out around more around here? Do you need a little bit more rest? Because we're both projectors, right? Uh, so <laughs> understanding that um, so the human design has brought like like you said, um, how to be a steward for one another to really honor each other in our energy. Absolutely. And, you know, even just thinking about how the other person works and and being able to to be committed as a partner to that, right? You know, I, I, I talk about this a lot with my partners and with my clients, like it should feel like we're all on the same team, right? You should be invested in me and my best self and I should be invested in you and your best self. And I think oftentimes what people prioritize over that is the relationship. We have to put the relationship first and then in individual identities come after that. And what I, what I would personally say is that individual identities come first and then what we make out of that comes second, right? Because at the end of the day, the only person we really have is our ourselves. You know, something could happen to your partner, God forbid, but you know, you could break up, something else could happen, whatever it might be. And if your identity is totally tied into being so-and-so's partner or so-and-so's in so-and-so's relationship, who are you then after that's over? Or who are you then when that's on the rocks? Who are you then when, you know, things are maybe not going exactly the way you want them to, or if it's not in alignment for you, right? It is so much, much harder to detangle yourself from an identity when it is not truly about you, right? And it is about this other person that you have now identified with and and encapsulated your identity with. And so now you're not only just having to untangle for yourself, you're like, well, now I have to untangle for what this means for my partner, what this means for our friends, what this means for the business, what this means. And you've just started to have to detangle yourself in such a deep way that especially with an undefined G, I could imagine that it would be really hard to know, you know, who am I in this moment and who am I in this partnership? And I think, you know, for me, when I was growing up, people pleasing was a really big tendency of mine. And that came from a lot of just feelings of, you know, my childhood and and how I was growing up and, and how I was being conditioned. But um, being able to move out of that as I got older to really recognize that people pleasing is not in of service to anyone, right? It's really just in of service to appearance. I want to be liked. I want to seen as I want to be seen as being well liked. I want to be seen as nice. I want to be seen as right. I want to be perceived a certain way. And I think for projectors in particular, that's a dangerous and slippery slope because we rely so heavily in our strategy around being recognized. And so if we're then just receiving constant recognition and constant accolades and positive reinforcement for our people pleasing behaviors, it is, I think, a very easy for projectors to identify with that is like, oh, that's who I am. And that is my identity because you're clearly reflecting back to me that that's good and valid. And I think it's important as projectors that we really use our discernment to say, if what is what I'm being recognized for actually what I want to be recognized for, right? Or is this something that is benefiting everybody else, but depleting me? Yeah. And that's where I was just going to ask, 
you know, what advice would you give somebody who feels like they always get lost in relationships? But I think it goes back to spending time by yourself and recognizing yourself. Yes. Cause that's what I tell projectors. I'm like, Hey, yeah. it doesn't matter what people see in you. It doesn't matter what invitations yeah. you're receiving. Like your power is held in how you see yourself. And so taking yeah. some time alone and truly getting down to understanding yourself, it doesn't matter if you're a generator, a manifesting generator or projector, right? It's really yeah. about truly um, connecting and, and finding yourself before you enter into a relationship. I think it's so hard to try to find yourself sometimes in a relationship. But if you're in a relationship yeah. and you feel lost, like I was, you know, me yeah. and my, me and my partner both have had completely just identity crisis. And, but the thing is, is that we've in the relationship, we've given each other the space and the support. I'm like, Hey, whatever you need, let's do this. I will support you. If you want to cut your hair, let's do this. If you want, whatever it is, I will be your biggest cheerleader. So yeah. you still can find yourself if you're in a relationship and you're wanting that, yeah. but make sure that you have that partner that can support you. And if you don't have that partner or that freedom to support you, that's where I would reevaluate your, you know, your situation. Absolutely. And I would say that to, you know, if you're really looking to find yourself in your relationships, the number one place that I recommend people to start is to, you know, this is an exercise I do with my clients sometimes is to spend some time writing down just initially, what do I desire in a partner, right? What would make me feel happy in a relationship and just write all the things down. And just, this is kind of a free writing exercise. I don't want, I don't ask folks to think too much about it. I just want it to be kind of stream of consciousness writing, right? What does that question bring up for you? Spend a couple of minutes doing that. And then after you've done that, go back and reread the list and cross out anything that you internalized as something that you want in a relationship because someone told you, you should want that in a relationship, right? Do I want this because I was told by society that I need to have this? Or do I want this because I actually feel like it's true and in alignment for me. You know, as a person who grew up in Japan and then moved to America and had this biracial identity, you know, there were a lot of things that I was noticing that I was told to want or desire that didn't feel really aligned for me. Um, but I was really struggling in relationships to figure out like, how do I detangle these things and really um, think about these in a different way? And you know, after you even do that exercise, looking back and seeing, okay, why did that even come up for me, right? Why was that in my stream of consciousness? Why did I say this? What is the root of that idea being present in my mind around relationships? Because something I say a lot is that just because we are conscious of something does not mean that we are always acting with that conscious awareness, right? Just because we've brought something to the awareness, just because we've brought something to the forefront that we need to work on or heal or work through doesn't mean that when we're activating when we're in something, when we're doing something, we're very viscerally aware of it and able to catch it and be able to, you know, um, be flexible and maneuver around it, right? Sometimes it's, we still engage in the thing, right? And then a day later, a week later, you know, whenever we're like, oh, I did this thing and that wasn't actually in alignment with what I wanted. And I know that, right? Um, and it's doing that again and again and again and again, that shortens that time span between something happening that's consciously, right? Something you're not in alignment with, but you're able to act with that conscious awareness at that time in real time. Yeah. I got to ask, cause you, yeah. what, um, <laughs> what offers do you have? Because even with people are just listening to you talk, people are going to reach out to you. What different <laughs> offers do you have, um, yeah. currently going on? I'm really glad that you asked me this. And so uh, right now I'm about to, uh, I'm a Leo for those of you who are listening, um, Leo gang. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Leo too. I'm, yeah. I think my birthday is like, uh, like three or four. I think it's a, uh, it's like a week before yours. That's all I know. Oh my gosh. I love that for us. So Leo gang gang. Um, so on July 23rd, I am going to be launching and releasing uh, aura type workbooks, which I'm feeling really excited about. These are something that I really wanted to provide to the community to help folks who are kind of in the beginning journey of their, uh, of their kind of exploration with human design. The workbooks really cover the different types and the strategies associated with the different types and how you can essentially maneuver and use those two things um, as a way to transform and change your life, even just as a bare minimum. Um, and so those will be uh, launching and releasing in July. I definitely offer, you know, guided readings if folks want me to look at their chart and things like that. I also offer intimacy, intimacy sessions right now as well if folks are curious about just diving a bit deeper into relationships and intimacy, whether that's in relationship to your human design, whether you want to do that with your partner and have some partnered conversations and things like that. And I said, I would say that the thing that I'm most excited about and would love to be invited out to do 
is um, partner with people for their events, whether that's a retreat, whether you're having a conference uh, or something like that, and you want somebody to come in to talk about intimacy or relationships or human design um, or any kind of intermingling of those things, I would be super, super, super excited to be able to do that. So that's kind of my main focus right now is trying to make connections. I'm a line four. So, uh, you know, networking is huge for me and I'm just always trying to figure out, you know, where my networks can get entangled. And so would love to be in community with folks, be on people's podcasts, things like that. Um, would love to be invited in if folks are interested. So, yeah. Do you uh, work? So I saw it because I got it from your page because I live in Texas yeah. too right now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Unique mindful event. Do you work yeah. there or did you just go there? Great question. I actually taught there. So uh, Unique Mindfulness Events is an overarching uh, kind of spiritual mindfulness event platform. So they house and promote. And uh, I do, t I believe, ticket sales for all of the kind of mindfulness events in the area. And so the link that you saw on my profile back in April is for an event called Ecstatic Forest, which was a kind of ecstatic dance type festival where it was about movement and things like that. And so I taught about rope there. We did some energetic embodiment for rope. Uh, I did some uh, tastings and lessons and things like that at the event itself. And then also um, shared a bit about human design and things like that. So uh, yeah, I don't work there, but it was a really great privilege to be able to teach for them. And I would highly recommend um, that website um, if you're listen, uh, interested in seeing some curated events around mindfulness in the central Texas area. Yeah, we, we were planning on, or we're planning on going. I want to go to one. I'm like, oh, yeah. this looks fun. This looks cute. We'd love to have you. Yeah, because we, um, at that point in time, our truck was in the shop, so we weren't yeah. able to do it, but I'm looking yeah. forward to next fall, yeah. or next fall, next spring. Yeah. Um, I have it on my little bucket list. <laughs> Please come. Yeah, and I'll probably, uh, I'll probably end up presenting or vending um, there as well. So I'd love to connect so we can hang out over there. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Sage, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Oh, this is such a great question. I just want to really encourage everyone to, to know that even if you're really lost right now, even if you feel like you're still figuring it out, even if you feel like you're stumbling along the way that like every step that you're taking, every <laughs> route that you're tripping over on your path, every stumble that you're taking, every scuff knee that you have is building you and bringing you to the truest and highest version of yourself. And I promise you that that version of yourself is so grateful and so, so, so supportive of the trials and tribulations that you're going on to get to where you need to be. And we are all just waiting for you to be here, to be with us, to arrive. Um, and we can't wait to see you. Do you have a podcast? Because girl, your channel of awakening, it is just, I'm, I'm going to leave off this uh, interview with such a high. It's just truly, it is, man, it's like butter. I love it. I, you're awesome. You. You're amazing, Sage. Thank you so much for uh, connecting with me today and hanging out with me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I love the beauty of how this kind of synergetically even came to be this podcast and this invitation. And I just appreciate you so much and all of your beautiful gifts that you share with us. I love your videos so much. I love the content that you put out. And so I'm just so grateful to get to share some space with you. So thank yes. you. You're welcome. I'll be